Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Guess what we're going to discuss today? Christmas. What is the real truth concerning Christmas? It's very important that you know the dates, what transpired, how it came to be, and how a Christian should really react to the nativity of Christ. It is well written in our Father's Word, and as we have just completed the book of Luke, so it's right there. Okay. And we're going to cover it. Luke was very concise, and his um, expertise in that we're going to draw from. So uh, with that word of wisdom from our Father concerning that nativity, we go to Luke chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, For as much, Luke states, as... Many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Many have written this, too, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. In other words, they were there, they observed it, and they are eyewitnesses. They can tell us exactly how it came to pass. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most excellent Theopolis. Theopolis means beloved of God. I think it was written to you. Not, this is not a, an individual by name, but should have been fully translated because you are beloved of God, because you're a child of God, and he wants you to know this. He said, I was there I have an excellent understanding of it, very precise. I want to share that with you. That's what he's saying. That thou mightest know the certainty, the exactness of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And then he begins in this fifth verse. There was, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, that means remembered of Yah, okay, of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, that means a teacher, and her name was Elizabeth, that's to say the oath of Yah. Now, um, what is most important here is what's Abiah, okay, because that's a date. That, that, that gives you a specific date of when this transpires so that you know and you can understand. Abaya was one of the 24 courses. 24 in numerics means the priesthood. And there were 24 courses of the priest that were responsible for the temple through the year. Each course served two weeks. Uh, uh, all to, um, at various times, about six months apart. And, and naturally, Abiah was the eighth course, which means new beginnings. So put this together, 24 is the order of the priesthood, and eight is new beginnings because with Christ, with that nativity, we all have new beginnings. We have forgiveness of sins, we have repentance. And that's what makes the nativity so very, very important to us. It's important that you make a mental note also that Elizabeth was a Levite of the daughters of Aaron. It's verse 6, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. In other words, they met all the legal requirements of the priesthood, meaning both the man and the woman had to be Levites to serve in this course, and so they were. So Elizabeth was a daughter of Aaron, a Levite. Verse 7, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both now were well stricken in years. They, they were advanced. They, they were getting on up in years. Too late for childhood, basically. Verse 8. 
And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, that's Abiah, the eighth course, verse 9, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, this is a date, and it's June the 13th through the 19th. Okay, You just write that down. June the 13th through the 19th is the course of Abiah. It is a date, and that's what Luke wants you to derive from this. Okay. And, and he goes out, and when he would burn incense, it was natural that the smoke would go up, and everybody felt that's when the prayers went up to God, and you wanted to be there praying when that happened. Okay. Next verse, verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So their prayers would go up with that smoke of the incense, okay, to the Father. They go up anyhow, okay? Your prayers always go up to the Father. Verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And of course, this will be Gabriel, okay? Gabriel in the Hebrew tongue means man of God, okay? Verse 12, And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. I mean, you know, this is not an everyday occurrence that a name that Gabriel appears, okay, there by the uh, altar of God, even in the temple of God, to this priest. So naturally, he's concerned. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias. For thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And you know something? There was no John in Zacharias' family. But God insisted that he be called John. That's the gift of God, because here it was a gift uh, of God to them. And, and certainly... Um, uh, at, at that time. But this is one of three or four people that God himself named. He didn't give him any choice. He said, you're going to call the child John. Okay. Verse 14. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. It's going to be a special child. Okay. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. That's before birth, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to find out when he's six months in the womb, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why the nativity is so very, very important. Don't miss it. Hang on to it. Verse 16, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Uh, and, in other words, he's not the Savior, but he's one that would stand down at the river Jordan saying, Repent! Uh, and many souls were turned. He was the forerunner of Messiah himself. Verse 17, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. That's to say Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In other words, to prepare that path, to prepare them to receive the Messiah. Now, I, I want you to always observe what you read. Did it say that John the Baptist was Elijah? Because it was promised in the Old Testament, one of the last chapters of the Old Testament in the great book of Malachi, that Elijah would come before that great day of the Lord and turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural. That means either to Satan or to the true father. But did it say John the Baptist was Elijah? No, it did not. It said he would come in the spirit of Elijah. And Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 11, he would have been if people had received him. Did they receive him? No, they beheaded him. Okay. He came in the spirit of Elijah. 
verse 18. And Zacharias said unto the angel, you, you know, Zacharias was a little bit of a doubter. You want to watch this. You want to be careful. I mean, this is Gabriel speaking. And John, I mean, Zechariah says to Gabriel, Whereby shall I know this question? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. Uh, Zechariah, this promise to him seemed a little bit too late. And in Mary's case, where the Holy Spirit will overshadow her, it would seem way too early, for she wasn't even married yet. So we got one here a little bit too late, it would seem, and the other a little bit too early. And Zacharias is uh, questioning Gabriel. That's not wise. Okay. Not wise to question Gabriel. 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. And am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. That's my obligation. Verse 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb. This is your sign. I'm going to give you a sign, all right. You're going to be dumb. Now, for a preacher, that's a bad thing. You're going to be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season, in their time. You know, it's a precious thing. For You see, God never leaves us warning. You're, you're not going to have it. I can't help but turn there in, in, uh, in Daniel chapter 9. Verse 21, Gabriel makes another appearance even to Daniel, who was ever so wise. This same Gabriel, do you know what he said then? This would be uh, over 400 years before the fact of he appearing to Zacharias. Okay. Listen to it. Verse 21 of Daniel chapter 9. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being uh, caused to fly swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation, about the time for the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. I want to show you something. I want to share something with you. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. For thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. You think about it. Okay. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. That's Jerusalem. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And of course, that would be Christ. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. In other words, to make this come right to the point, Gabriel told Daniel exactly how long it would be before the nativity of Christ. That there would be 69 weeks would pass. And then he left the one week which we call the gap theory. Which that last week is the very end of this earth age. When in the middle of the week the desolator, the false one, appears. It's all recorded. Gabriel made it very clear. The same Gabriel that brought this Christmas message. The same Gabriel that brought this message to Zechariah on June, between June the 13th and the 19th in the year of the Nativity. The conception. So, you see, God's word is complete. And Gabriel, the angel that stands before God, you better count on him. Don't doubt him. 
as John did. John's not going to be able to say a word. All through this pregnancy of his wife. Let's go with the next verse in Luke chapter 1, verse 21. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. I mean, he, he seemed, he's never going to come out of there. 22, and when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. He made all kinds of motions and signs, but he couldn't talk, couldn't tell them what happened. He just kept on making signs. Don't doubt God. Okay. Don't doubt, doubt God's messengers, especially when it's one of the archangels. Verse 23. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Now, this means that on June the 19th, he left for his home. Okay. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. Now reckon this, it's a date, okay? It would take him with the Sabbath between the 23rd and the 24th to get home. And no doubt, Elizabeth conceived on the 24th of June. Okay in that year and then she hid herself five months five months following june the 24th is november the 24th it's a date okay there, there's no excuse for anyone guessing about the nativity when it is rec recorded it is written and in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Well, that's a month later. That, that would go from November the 24th to a full month would be December the 25th. Well, now, wait, this, this is normally what we consider the birth of Christ. Not so. It is written. It is logged that this event that we're about to read happened on December the 25th. Not Christ's birth, but what? Let's read it. Verse 27, to continue. To a virgin espoused, that's to say betrothed, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Mary means a tear. 28, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that are, are highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. She was chosen. God chose her. He sent Gabriel. There's one thing I want you to notice about Mary. You will never find any doubt. She will be a little bit amazed knowing it's a little premature. But she doesn't doubt what Gabriel says to her. Verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of uh, salutation this should be. I mean, she was trying to, she wasn't doubting, she was just reasoning in her mind, what does all this mean? Verse 30, And the angel said unto her, this being Gabriel, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. So, Yeshua, that is to say. Now, uh, I mean, here, Mary's not even married. And she is betrothed. She's engaged to Joseph, who's of the tribe of David, which is to say the tribe of Judah. And again, God himself is naming this baby. 
Just as he named John, John, he named Jesus, Jesus. Well, interpret it. Yahweh's Savior. Okay. The Savior of Yahweh. That's what the word Yeshua, Jesus, means, being translated. That's what God wanted him to be. That's what he was. Verse 32. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He's going to take it. He's king of kings. He's lord of lords. Forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it is. That's why this nativity is so very, very important. Okay. Extremely important. Here we are on December the 25th and what's transpiring? The conception. Then think a moment. Don't let that disappoint you because when did Christ begin to dwell with man? At conception. You're going to find out at conception because soon Mary's going on that same day, December the 25th, is going to run to her cousin Elizabeth's house. And as, as she approaches Elizabeth, John, who will be six months in her womb, leapt because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why they said he would be endowed with the Holy Spirit, John would, because from conception... In the womb of Mary, that presence was felt by John, who was still a, an embryo born, a, 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 a um, infant in his mother's womb, was touched by the Holy Spirit. We'll document this here in a moment. Verse 33 to continue. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob, forever, not for a while, not for a term, forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I, I know not a man? Now, now that's not doubt. She's simply asking, How could this be yet? I, I'm not married, I, and I know no man. I've never been with a man. I'm a virgin. How can this possibly be? She's just reasoning and asking, and that's fine. She, she um, still believed. She just wanted to know how. He's going to tell her. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And so it was, as it was written in St. John, I'm sorry, as it is written in Isaiah, as it is written in Isaiah chapter 7, which we covered very recently, and we're going to turn there again. And in Isaiah chapter 7, prophesied long before, <clears throat> we have in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Well, that's the same thing that Gabriel said to uh, John and Mary, um, Zacharias and Mary. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so it was, being Yahweh with us, which is to say Yeshua, which is to say Yahweh's Savior. How precious the Word of God. You see, we were prepared long ago for this. The fact that that conception would take transpire. It's just that people have a little trouble putting it all together sometimes keeping it in line. Verse 36, returning to Luke chapter 1. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her 
who is called bear who was called barren there it was december the 25th and but do you notice something strange there um gabriel it wasn't some person that said elizabeth was her cousin that was gabriel it was the angel of god said your cousin elizabeth now, now let's analyze just a moment. You see, the reason Luke is so concise, there is a great deal of information within this that you must acquire, absorb, accept with understanding. I mean, Elizabeth, it's already said that she met all the credentials to be the wife of a Levitical priest and it stated very clearly that she was of the daughters of Aaron. That makes her a Levite. Not of the tribe of Judah. Not of David's tribe. So what's happening here? Then we understand. If Mary's father, Heli, who was of the tribe of Judah was of the tribe of Judah, then how did Mary get to be a cousin to Elizabeth? There's only one way. And again, it was Gabriel that said this, not some, not some uh, uh, statistician. It was Gabriel, the archangel. There's only one way, and it's very simple. Is Elizabeth's mother and Mary's mother were sisters. And Heli of the tribe of Judah, which is legal, married a Levitical girl who was the mother of Mary. Meaning Mary was both of the Levitical uh, line as well as of Judah. And with God being the father of that son, the only begotten, it meant what was joined together here in this was both the priest line and the king line whereby it could be said that this child this conception would be the king of kings as well as the lord of lords in other words both king and priest forever after the order of melchizedek so there you have it you know in this same, if you go, many would say, well, it says in Matthew chapter 1. It doesn't matter what it says in Matthew chapter 1. That's Joseph's genealogy in who, in, to whom Mary is betrothed. You find, quite the contrary, you find Mary's genealogy right here in the book of Luke in chapter 3. And it's made very clear to one with understanding. In chapter, you're not going to have it, just turn to chapter 3, verse 23. And what does it say? And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being in Perin, as was supposed. That means by law, got it? As by law, the son of Joseph which was the son of Heli. In other words, there were no other children in that family, and, the, and Mary's lineage would pass to her husband. But you will notice there's no begats here. Because as things are the same today as it was yesterday, they're in-laws, not begats, but in-laws. Joseph was uh, uh, Heli's son-in-law. But Mary was his daughter. Okay. So it's really quite simple. Again, as by law, that means uh, the law of marriage. In-laws. In-laws by law. That's what it means. That's what the Greek is very specific about. And at the same time, while we're here, on, on to verse 31, there's something you should be, make note of that is separate in this genealogy and the one in Matthew 1 of Joseph is that Mary came through as you will notice in verse 31 which was the son of Nathan 
not Solomon, but Nathan, which was the son of David. In other words, Mary, the virgin, came through the lineage of Nathan, not Solomon. And therefore, being the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Holy One, the Son of God, the only begotten, then we see was um, both of the tribe of Levi and also of the tribe of Judah. And this is why Paul himself would say to you concern, in, in the great book of Hebrews, as was supposed that he was of the tribe of Judah, but was forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see, he knew. Paul knew. What's important, Gabriel knew. God gives us all this information, but he expects you to take the nativity serious enough that you check it out. Well, should we celebrate the November the 25th? Why would you want to be a Scrooge? That's the day the Holy Spirit began dwelling with us. That was the day of conception. So naturally, make the most of it. Celebrate it. The day that this wonderful event transpired, how precious it is that our Father shares this with us. Our Father lets us know the true, the true genealogy, which is, you know something? To really enjoy the key of David, you've got to have that genealogy, or you don't have the key of David. That's to say, his generations. All right, we're going to take a little break. We'll be back and pick this up right here. Now, you don't go away. Stand by. Won't you a moment, please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. You know, to receive the blessings of a Christian, a Christian must be familiar with Christ. That's where our blessings come from, and that's why the Christian nations are always blessed of God. And that may upset some people, but I mean, hey, look at it. You show me a nation that's not a Christian nation and tell me what happens there. So it becomes very important. And that's not, um, some might say, well, that sounds a little uppity. No, it isn't. It's just fact. It's just truth. Always search the truth in Christianity and it'll set you free from one-upmanship and from the lies of Satan, from the misleadings of man, and give you the simple truth. That's what Luke is bringing to you here. Okay, so we found out that Mary was both of the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah. Therefore, the Son of God, with God being the Father, is both the priest line and the king line. And boy, can he fill that bill. So, let's pick it up again, if we may, in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. And it reads... For with God, nothing shall be impossible. He can cause anything to happen. He can cause that virgin to conceive. He, in the beginning, he spoke and nothing became something. You became you. Your soul did. He created you. 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. She didn't doubt. She accepted it. It um, 
Uh, you know, uh, d this took some what? Because this would be stoning for a single girl. Okay. 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste. Same day. December the 25th. Into a city of Judah. 40. And entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Give her a greeting. Now understand what has happened. The conception has taken place. And with haste, Mary went instantly to her cousin, 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Right then, as God promised, way back when John was conceived also. Verse 42. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. 43. And which is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Who am I, Elizabeth says, that the mother of my Lord should come to me, to my house? 44. And lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. When, when does life, when does the soul enter the baby? At conception. This documents it, this proves it beyond any shadow of a doubt that the soul enters the child at conception because the soul bearing the Holy Spirit, was sensed by the babe still in the womb. Verse 45, And blessed, happy, is she that believed, for there shall be a performance, a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. It's going to happen. You can count on it, it's what she's saying here. What a precious thing it is that that Mary and Elizabeth, these two cousins, one bringing forth that great Baptist who Jesus himself would go down to be baptized by him in the River Jordan, just before he would go out into the wilderness of temptation. And John the Baptist would be down at that river saying, Repent! And and you know, when the Kenites came down, he called them, you offspring of vipers, uh, you children of Satan. John didn't cut any slack. And Jesus would say of this John, these two cousins now, these mothers have these babes in the womb. This is what they will exercise. Jesus would say, hey. What did you go out there in the wilderness to see? Speaking of John. A reed shaken in the wind? Did you go out there thinking you would hear some man who would believe this one minute and something else the next? No, I tell you, you went out there and heard straight arrow. That's to say John with the plumb line straight on. No ifs, no ands, no maybes, but the truth straight from him as he prepared the way for that Messiah that came down and was baptized, and at the same time the heavens opened, and doves ascended, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, and that voice from Almighty God himself would say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He was pleased with him. Even as he was growing up, even as he would be with his jo jo Joseph of Arimathea, Mary's uncle. As he would grow up, and at 12 years old, he would go to the temple and would amaze the doctors there. Because of the doctrine this child had absorbed. When after all, the word became flesh and walked among us. That's what we saw on that day when these two cousins and this nativity took place. Yeah, don't you ever fail to celebrate December the 25th and, and call it Christmas. Merry Christmas. 
Don't let some Scrooge take that away from you. It's, the, it's one of the high days when that conception took place, that the Holy Spirit began to dwell with man as promised of God. Something, that's what we live for and by, is his guidance, his direction, his protection, as he leads us and as he guides us. Let's go on with the next verse. Verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. She was so happy about that. She didn't complain. 47, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She mentions even the word Savior. And here in her womb was the Savior of the world. Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior. Verse 48, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden for Behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And so it was that she was blessed. You know, she ended that lineage, starting all the way back to Mother Eve, when God made the statement in the book of Genesis that Eve would be the mother of all living this would come to its fulfillment in Mary, blessed of God. For in Mary came forth the Savior of the world. And you either are in Him, you know, or you don't have eternal life. You don't have living as Mother Eve was promised through her, meaning eternal life. Well, ooh, well why, why would I not have eternal life? It's going to be cut short, friend, if you don't, if you don't um, respect and accept Christianity. That may offend some, be that as it may. It's all right with me. Just fine. You, you sail your own ship. You make your own choice. You, you uh, set what you ask for is what you get. Okay? If that's just the way it is, therefore you have no complaint. But here is this blessed day of conception, documented and dated in the Word of God. You know, some are going to say, well, if there were 24 courses of, um, of Abaya, and some had to serve two courses, how do we know it wasn't the other course of Abaya? Now, you with Companion Bibles, you're very fortunate because you have an Appendix 179 that will tell, teach you more about the birth of, uh, of Christ and the date, the fact that the conception took place December the 25th, that the birth took place September the 29th, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and, what, and he was circumcised on the eighth and the final day of the feast. No accident. You'll find it written in that appendix 179. So, how precious it is that our Father sets all this forth. But why do we know it is not the other set, uh, the other course of Abiah? And it's really quite simple. Because the shepherds were still in the field. The opposite course would have been in uh, late October, December. Six months later, there's no grass in the field in the winter time. The sheep are not left in the field in the winter time. They are brought back to your sheep cot, your surroundings, and sheltered and fed there until spring when they go back out again. So it's really quite simple. It's following the laws of nature. And again, you with Companion Bibles, Appendix 179 will give you more reasons over and over that you can have this and enjoy it as the one of the most wonderful times of the year. The time that the Holy Spirit began dwelling with us. The word came by Gabriel. One of the 
highest of the archangels, he that announces the arrival of Christ, and no doubt will the second advent as well. You can count on it. He's a fantastic angel. Gabriel, again, meaning man of God. And boy, is he a man of God. You don't want to mess with him. You want to listen to him when God sends him. Most of all, you listen to God's word. But here you have this course of Abiah, which is a date. It is written. Have you read it? It is written. Have you absorbed it? Have you understood it? This is why, this is why Luke would say, I want to give you the exactness of it. Because it is exact. It's perfect. And that's as our Father would have it. You know, you have many things in Babylon that sound even similar to that that is in Christ. You know, you take, they, they write of a flood, we had a flood. Okay. But they always copy. It's always mythology. It's not the real thing. God's word is the real thing. And basically you can document it. It is written in time and it is written in stone. The very events, the creation, the continuation, and life itself. That through Eve's offspring, which would come down to Mary, they would be the mother of all living because from them would come this blessed event that brought forth the Holy Spirit dwelling with man whereby we have salvation and we have eternal life. Now, mythology will lead you down Primrose Lane in many ways. Many would say, well, it says in Jeremiah they go out and they cut a tree and they deck it and they worship it. That's not a Christmas tree. That's an idol formed by idol worshipers. Have you ever known anybody that put up a Christmas? I just don't want the Grinch to steal everything away. Evergreen stands for eternal life. You know, most trees shed their leaves. Evergreens are evergreen, meaning they don't die. But they're not seasonal. It's year round. Now I don't, I know in horticulture we could disagree with that. Be that as it may. But it's the evergreen is picked for the simple fact that it does symbolize life eternal. But how many people have you ever known that go out and put a Christmas tree up and worship it instead of God? It doesn't happen. Okay. It doesn't happen at all. Now, personally, I don't put a Christmas tree up. Okay. And, but, but that's fine. If you want to, that's, you know, and I can give you a scripture. As a matter of fact, we're going to turn there. Turn with me to the book of salvation, which is Hosea. Hosea means salvation. And, and Hosea made a prayer, okay, in his last chapter. Um, and and we, we would find in verse 1, Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity, your faults and your shortcomings and everything. And in the fourth verse, God begins to speak. He answers Hosea. I mean, Hosea has been told to go marry a harlot and what have you, which was symbolic of Israel going after um, other gods and so forth. But finally, God answers his prayer in this 14th chapter. You're going to have it. Listen to it. Verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For mine anger is turned away from him. When they repent, when they come to him, when they accept that nativity of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 5. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Have you ever smelt Lebanon? That's evergreen. That's the cedar tree. That fresh smell. You know, I've got an, an old cedar chest. 
And when I have something that's woolen or something else that I don't want moths or insects or anything to bother, I put it in that chest. And I guarantee you that cedar, that fragrance, drives away anything that would attack or, or uh, take away from clothing, such as moths or what have you. Very protecting. But like the lily of the valley. He was that lily of the valley in the rose of Sharon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, that healing oil of our people. And his smell as Lebanon, the smell of that cedar, that freshness, that filling fragrance that is so clean. Verse 7, that they dwell under his shadow, they that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the vine, the wine of Lebanon. And so it is, again, that tree, that evergreen, the evergreen which symbolizes eternal life. The word Lebanon means white, okay, purity. Verse 8, listen carefully, it's why we came here. Ephraim shall say, that's the larger of the ten tribes, it's the house of Israel. What have I to do anymore with idols? Don't want them, wouldn't have anything to do with them. I have heard him and observed him. And then God answers. Listen to the words of God. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. The meaning God is saying in that as a green fir tree symbolizes eternal. I am eternal. And our Father is eternal. So you be real careful. Don't let uh, Babylonianism rob you of that that is true, that that is real, that that is fresh, that that God has taught, that that God, God uses symbolism. It helps us remember. It helps us even smell the freshness. But that's God himself saying, I am a green fir tree evergreen. So you want to be real careful how you try to take away. Like I said, we worship Almighty God. We don't worship some tree. It is wonderful to have a tree that is symbolic of eternal life, which is our Father. But Father always comes first. Father, Spirit, was in that womb. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's the Spirit of God. And that Spirit was with us on December the 25th, that day of nativity, documented by Dr. Luke in the book of Luke, in the courses of Abiah, 24 courses, 24 meaning priesthood, the eighth course, which is Abiah, being new beginnings, and in the birth of Christ, the conception of Christ, we witnessed those new beginnings, the beginning of our salvation, the beginning of acceptance by Almighty God, by receiving the message from Gabriel, both before and during the new beginnings, the birth of Jesus Christ. One more verse. God saying, I am like a green fir tree. Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Do you? Are you wise? Do you have that understanding? Prudent. And he shall know them. You'll understand them. No, no big step for a stepper. You will understand the simplicity for the ways of the Lord are right, 
You can always look for that. Look for what is just and right, and you have the way of the Lord. And the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. The very truth itself shall cause them to stumble and fall. Don't, don't let the Satanist Grinch steal the truths of God's Word. Don't let the Grinches spoil for the little children the truth of the conception, the truth of the birth, and the gift that it was to mankind that now we have forgiveness for our shortcomings. Because he forgives us. He is the one that his body took the stripes. And we received the healing. He would ultimately be delivered up. And he would never open his mouth or whimper. He would pay that price for you. So God bless you. God bless America. God bless those that follow our Christian ways. God bless the world. And remember, it's Merry Christmas. It's the time of conception. Don't let someone take it away from you. Don't let it fade. The brightness and the joy and the happiness that came to us by the announcement by Gabriel, the Holy Spirit, was with us, not for a little while, but forever. Amen, amen, and amen. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-643. 4645 24 hours a day you may also request our introductory offer by writing to shepherd's chapel post office box 416 gravit arkansas 72736